Hey, I'm really glad you're here today. I'm Robert Emmett. I'm one of the pastors at Community Bible Church. I've been out for a few weeks, so you might not have seen me or you saw the messages. But anyway, back to CBC Online. Really glad to be talking to you. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out as we get started in today's message on prayer. First of all, we have a prayer link. You can have any prayer request you've got. If you'll go down and click the prayer request and uh, just type in your request, we have prayer warriors that pray for you all day and night. And uh, don't know really how prayer works in the supernatural, but I know it does, and I know God says to do it. Robin Erdley is he heads up all of our stuff on there. She is awesome. You've seen her. She hosts a lot of different groups and things. So if something's going on in your life, problems, issues, whatever it might be, if you want somebody to pray for you, if you want a bunch of people to pray for you, just go down to the prayer request and they'll be sure and take care of that. Hey, Neil Smith, who oversees our CBC online ministry, I asked him the other day, I said, what are our, our top 10 cities that view us? Amazing. If you're watching right now, you, we're all over America, but the top 10 cities outside of San Antonio, let me give them to you. Number one on the list is uh, Algiers, Algeria, New Delhi, India, Karachi, Pakistan, Addis Adiba, Ethiopia, Lahore, Pakistan, Tirana, Albania, Dubai, United Arab Emirates, Colombo, Sri Lanka, Manila, Philippines, and Kathmandu, Nepal. <laughs> I don't know how on earth we get out there in all the world, but I tell you what, if you're in any of those cities, welcome to CBC Online. We're honored to have you. I hope that you've trusted Jesus for, as your Lord and that if this is your worship service, then we're just glad to have you. Uh, the music is wonderful and the message is straight out of God's Word. If you ever get to San Antonio, you got to come up and say hi. And if you're from any of those cities, would you do me a favor? Uh, wherever you are, if you would just type in, hey, that's me, or just give us a shout out, we'd really appreciate it. Thanks for making CBC Online work. Now, today we're looking at prayer. Uh, all of us get asked to be prayed for sometime or another. You know, you might have a friend, pray for me, I'm taking a test. Pray for me, I'm getting an interview. Pray for my doctors, this, whatever. And we're pretty good at the three-word prayer. Lord, bless them. Lord, help them. Lord, heal them. Lord, protect them. Jesus talked about praying. He said in Matthew chapter 6, he said, when we pray, uh, a few things. He said, don't babble on like other religions do. He said, don't rant. Don't chant and don't show off. He said, when you pray, go privately into your closet and keep it sensible and keep it brief. He said, your father already knows what you need even before you ask him. And then he laid out the Lord's Prayer. And uh, the Lord's Prayer, a lot of us grew up memorizing that and saying it all the time. It's really, think of it as an outline, a guide to help you. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Then you can stop and pray the names of God. Uh, and then you, you just follow through that. But I'm not talking about the Lord's Prayer today. But that's Matthew 6. If you want to check it out, you can go there. But when somebody says, pray for me, uh, what we're going to learn today is in Colossians chapter 1, how do you pray for each other? So if you have your Bibles, open them or tap them to Colossians chapter 1. Now, three things I want you to remember when you pray for people. Number one, pray that they will know God's will. Number two, pray that they will change their life. And number three, pray that they will experience the supernatural. Know God's will, change their life, experience the supernatural. If I came to you today and I said, hey, would you pray for me? You just say, Robert, I'd be glad to. And when you get on your knees and pray tonight, you say, Lord, I pray that you would show Robert your will and that he would change his life accordingly and that you would allow him to experience the supernatural. Now, Colossians chapter 1, if you're there, uh, verse 9. Uh, and let me give you a quick review because maybe you haven't been in Colossians with us. We just started it. It's 15-minute read. It takes 15 minutes to read all of Colossians. Powerful book. It's kind of like the Bugatti super sport of the, of the Bible world. I mean, it's, it's powerful, it's short, it's quick, and it covers everything from prayer, church, the Trinity, eternity, heaven, hell, demons, angels, how to live, relationships. 15 minutes uh, in Colossians, and that'll change your life. Now, with that said, you can read your intro in, in your Bibles with it. But look at verse 9. He said, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now remember, the first thing we want to pray for each other is that God would give them 
or give you, give each other, God would give us complete knowledge of His will. Now, in the New Living Translation, he gives three ideas there. He says, uh, knowledge of His will, spiritual wisdom, and understanding. So think of knowledge as the what. Think of uh, wisdom as the why, and think of understanding as the how. What does God want me to do? Why does He want me to do it? And how do I apply that to my daily life? Pray for one another that we would discover God's will. I used to work with college students a lot, and one of the most pressing questions of college students and young adults is, I just want to know God's will. Pray for me. I want to know God's will. And, you know, and people kind of, you know, they, they think there's this mysterious, you got to go over there, got to go over there, you got to hike a mountain in Nepal and get a vision from God to discover His will. And we wonder, how do we find the, the will of God? Listen, it's not that complicated. God of the universe has made it simple. He put his will in the word. And remember this, when you know the word of God, you will know the will of God. I like that. I'm going to say it again. When you know the word of God, you will know the will of God. So how do I learn God's will? It's pretty simple. I pick up my Bible and I begin to read it. Right now, you're 15 minutes away from reading the entire book of Colossians. And in it, you will learn some incredible ideas on how to be a better husband, a better wife, how to be a better child, how to uh, increase your wages and do better in business, how to get along with people, how to forgive. Uh, It's just, it's a powerful book, 15 minutes. What does God want me to do? He wants you to open his word and read it and do what it says. So pray for each other that we will know God's will. How do we know God's will? We open his word, we read it, we say, Lord, open my eyes to any truths you want me to see. And when he does, that's knowing God's will. Now, the second prayer he prays is in verse 10. He says, once you know God's will, it says, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Let's read that again. Once you know God's will, he says, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. Notice the then, keep it there. Then means now that you know God's will, it's up to you to change your life. God's not going to make you change, but he's going to reveal his will to you. He's going to show you what you should start. He's going to show you what you should stop. And then he's going to expect you by the power of the Holy Spirit to change your life. That's why he says, we know God's will, then the way we live will always honor and please the Lord. So there's a change in there. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. The Christian life isn't just about praying a prayer, trusting Jesus, and knowing you're going to heaven whenever you die. It's about trusting Jesus, receiving the Spirit, opening up the Word of God, and daily just kind of going through it five or ten minutes and just say, Lord, open my eyes to what I'm supposed to see. And when He shows it to you, then you change your life. It's about a changed life. Colossians 1.6 says, The good news is changing the lives of people all over the world. I'm going to read it because it really applies to you since we got friends in Pakistan and Dubai and everywhere else. It says, 1.6, This same good news that came to you is going all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. If you have a Bible, mark that. Bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, going all over the world. What you and I are doing right now through CBC Online is exactly what that verse is about. The good news is going all over the world. It's going to Nepal. It's going to Pakistan. It's going to Dubai. It's going to all those other cities I mentioned. And it's changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. Mark that in your Bible. The message of Jesus Christ forgives you, saves your soul, but then it changes your life. That's, what, that's the power of the message of Jesus. See, if, if all we do is learn the facts and the figures and the histories and it doesn't change our life, it's no more than philosophy. But if we read it and begin to put it into practice and discover our relationships are better and our life improves, that's the power of a changed life. He says here that we're supposed to grow in our faith and, the, the, and bear fruit. Uh, if you read your Bible, Galatians chapter 5, 23 talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Let me just list those for you right now. Love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We're supposed to be growing in those things. We're supposed to be making those more and more. I should have more love in me this year than I had last year. I should have more peace this year than last year. I should have more self-control now than I used to because the Christian life isn't a stagnant thing. It's a growing thing. It's like a tree that continues to bear fruit and grow and, and do what, uh, you know, and be productive. Christianity is you're supposed to be going forward in your faith. Uh, you're supposed to be growing your ministry. You're supposed to be repenting of your sins. You're supposed to be taking on the new attitude that's Christ. It's all about a changed life. So if you would, keep that in mind. What are we praying for each other? I pray that you will know God's will and that you will change your life. Now, some of you have read Colossians already, and uh, if you go there, you learn a lot of different things in Colossians. Let me just put up a list of a few of the things you learn. If you read Colossians, 15 minutes, husbands, in nine words, you learn how to transform your marriage. Husband, love your wives and never treat them harshly. That's pretty simple. All you got to do is be nice to your wife and it'll transform. Hand her back all those marriage books she's been giving you over the years to say, hon, I've got it figured out. God says to love you and never treat you harshly. If you'll do that, she'll be a happy wife. Wives, there's a verse in there, and I'll summarize it for you. Respect your husbands. Men put deer heads and fish bodies on the walls of their house because they want to be respected. So be a smart wife, respect your husband, build him up, and he'll be that loving man that you've been praying for. Fathers, don't aggravate your children. Employees, work hard at whatever you do as if you were working for Jesus. You know what I love about Colossians? There's no exceptions in there. He doesn't say work hard for the Christian bosses. He says work hard for all the bosses. You might be thinking, well, he doesn't know my supervisor. Doesn't need to. What you need to know is you do your work hardly. Wake up tomorrow morning and just say, Lord, this day from 8 to 5 or uh, 7 to 11, whatever your shift is, just say, Lord, I'm going to give my boss the very best I can all day long. You do that and you honor Jesus. Everyone, it says, live wisely among the non-believers. If you're in Pakistan, you have learned the secret of living wisely among non-believers. It's not an easy task. Everyone, it says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive those who offend you. That's a tough one. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive those who offend you. A few weeks ago, I had a situation where somebody had, had offended me. And being the holy man that I am, I didn't get even. I didn't fire back. I just, oh, that's all right. But it bugged me. You know, you kind of internalize it and you just stew and simmer over it. And the next morning, I was reading Colossians, the whole book, 15 minutes, doesn't take long. And I just said, Lord, open my eyes to whatever it is you want me to see. And I'm reading in there. And in chapter 3, it says that exact same thing. He said, make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive those who offend you. And remember that Jesus Christ forgave you for your sins. Well, when I read that, it's kind of like, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> no, I'm not very bright, but I can figure that one out. And instantly I said, all right, Lord, I forgive that person, whether they ask for it or not, and I'm going to make allowance for their faults. And it changed my attitude that very day. So what I'm teaching you, I'm living it, and it works. I'm telling you it does. Pray that we know God's will. Pray that we would change our lives accordingly. So not all at once. Just say, hey, Lord, what's the one thing you want me to improve this day? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, whatever it might be. And then the third thing is to experience the supernatural. Number one, you want to know God's will. Number two, pray their lives would be changed. And number three, pray they would experience the supernatural. I love the definition for supernatural. I looked at it on the web. Let me show you. And maybe we got it on there. Put it up. Yeah, there it is. Supernatural, a manifestation or event attributed to some force beyond scientific understanding or the laws of nature. And then I added, in other words, God. The supernatural. And it's not all this spooky and hovering and all of that. Get that out of your mind. Supernatural. Events or manifestations, things that happen that science and the laws of nature cannot explain. Divine appointments, supernatural. For a bunch of you watching this, probably the fact that you found out about us. How on earth did we connect with you all over the world? That's the supernatural. Laws of nature don't explain it. 
Uh, science doesn't explain it, but maybe a friend says to a friend, you've got to check this out. It may be the very thing you've been praying for. You connect. That's the supernatural. Now, in verse 11, Paul says, here's what we pray for you on the supernatural. Look at it. He says, we also pray that you will be strengthened with his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. Supernatural. He says there are four identifying marks or four areas, not the only ones, but supernatural patience or endurance. Whenever you read endurance in the Bible, it's talking about hard times, difficulties, enduring some, going through something that you know physically you could not endure, the pain's unbearable, but for some strange reason you got through it and you wonder, wow, where did that come from? That's the supernatural. Patience, that deals with people, people that irritate you and frustrate you. Maybe you get mad and upset and you have that internalizing like I was doing with somebody that offended me. And then you read God's word and you say, all right, Lord, I forgive them. I make allowance for their faults. Suddenly they don't bother you anymore. You experience the supernatural. Uh, when you have joy, not this silly giddy, oh, I'm always happy, you know, like a any, not so smart person, but, but the joy that says, you know what, I have this peace, I know God's in control. The situation isn't good, it's not pleasant, it's not easy, it's hard, but I know God's in control, I know these things are going to work out, and because of that, I have this joy, I have peace, I have happiness. That is the supernatural. And then he talks about thankfulness, being thankful to God. You're a Christian. Whenever you die, you get an inheritance from God. It's just yours because of Jesus Christ. He's forgiven your sins. He's given you freedom, given you new life, given you the Holy Spirit that guides you. He's given the Word of God that you can read and understand. All of those things are thankful. Uh, Ray Jones, one of our worship leaders at CBC, he always says, if God never does another thing for you, all that he has done is enough. I asked him, I said, did you make that up? And he said, no, he stole it from somebody else. But it's a great line. If God never does another thing for us, all that he has already done is enough. So in your prayer life, when you're thankful to God, you you may be going through a difficult time, but you wake up, Lord, thank you that my mind works, my eyes see, my ears hear, my mouth speaks, my lungs breathe, my heart moves the blood. Praise you that my body moves. Praise you that I have friends. Thank you for my spouse, my wife, my husband, my children, my work, my business, my church, my friends, CBC Online, and everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you thankfulness. I love the last part of that. He tells us some of the things to be thankful for in verse 12, because he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his son, who's purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. We have so much to be thankful for. Uh, Being rescued, you know, when it says rescued, it means we didn't have anything to do with it. We were lost and didn't know where we were going or what was happening, but God got to us. So we're not a part of that. We're, We're, it's a gift. I don't know if you've ever been lost before. It's a strange feeling. It's a sick feeling, kind of, you know, you don't know where you're at or where you go, maybe in another city. Uh, A few uh, weeks ago, I was in the Northwest, Washington, and my daughter, visiting my daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren up there, my daughter wanted to go running on these trails in the woods, and I said, oh, I'd love to. So we go out there, and, you know, if you've been from the Northwest, it's gorgeous, big, tall trees, ferns everywhere. It's 70 degrees, you know, shady. It was cool. There was a creek going through there. I mean, it's just like running in in paradise or something. If you're from Texas or a hot region, uh, you know, you can only imagine what it would be like. And so we're there. She says, this is the trail we're on. She said, just keep turning right. She said, Hershey and I, Hershey's her dog. She said, Hershey and I will take off, and you just stay on this trail. And she said, keep making right-hand turns. Whatever intersection it is, just go right. I said, I got it. So they take off. She runs a lot faster than I do. And the plan was, you know, they were going to take off, and I was going to run, and they were going to come around and then catch up with me. So good plan. We both run at our own pace. We're running along, and I'm just enjoying all the green, the ferns, and the streams and all of that. It's a marvelous time. And I look at my watch, and I realize we're 15 minutes past the rendezvous time. 15 minutes, I mean, that's a, for some of you, that's three miles. For me, it's about a little over a mile, but I was lost. I was on the trail, but apparently I was daydreaming and wasn't paying attention, and I had taken a left turn when I should have taken a right. I didn't know it. Looked around, new trails to me, had never been there. 
And so, you know, I'm looking. There's no signs. I mean, I don't know where to go. No signs, no people, no nothing. I'm lost in the woods. Now, if you've ever been instructed that you know that when you're in the wilderness, if you're lost, stay put. But that doesn't make sense when you're the guy that's lost. Stay put. You're lost, and you know you don't know where you are, and you doubt anybody else does too, so you're just going to stay right there. It's a, maybe a great idea in the book, but it's sure tough. So, I'm, you know, I thought, I'm not going to sit here. So I turned around and started running back. Finally got back to the intersection that I'd messed up on, and now there's another decision. See, when you're lost, logic and reason doesn't make sense. I thought, well, maybe I should take a right, and then that way I would catch her if she's trying to catch me. I thought, well, but if that's if I go left, maybe she's you know done the same thing, and she's turned around and going to catch me like that. I thought either way. And I thought maybe I should just stay put here at the intersection. It's the main trail, so she'll come get me. And I thought, well, what if she stays put on the other side, and so we never see each other? So it's one of those when you're lost, nothing makes sense. So I thought, all right, I'll just go left and start started running again. About 10 minutes later, I'm jogging along, waiting, hoping for some sign of hope. All of a sudden, I hear the galloping paws of a Labrador retriever. She comes running full speed, chain and all that, and she stops and wags her tail and jumps on me. I was thrilled to death. I mean, it's the first friendly face I'd seen in an hour, and uh, she's just wagging her tail. Oh, Hershey, I'm so glad you're here. And I don't know where Heather was. She wasn't around, but Hershey was there, so we just, you know, we, we were tired after that. About five minutes later, Heather comes running up, and she's winded and tired. She goes, where did you go? I said, Heather, I have no earthly idea, you know, but I'm sure glad that, you know, Hershey found me. I said, how'd she know to find me? And she said, well, it was pretty neat. She said, I was over there waiting for you at the trail entrance and didn't think you'd ever come, so I told Hershey, Hershey, go find Pops. And the dog just took off full speed. Now, Hershey, you know, I couldn't tell you a wonderful Labrador story without showing you the picture. So there she is, Hershey the Chocolate Lab. Ah, she's a cutie. Anyway, there's nothing in the dog training manual that says, go find Pops. But the dog's smart enough, and Heather said, go find Pops, and the dog found me. I was lost, and I was found. Yep, by a dog. But I'm here to tell you, when you're lost, a dog wagging his tail that knows where she's going, that's a welcome sight on the lost road. Now, I share that with you today because some of you may be out there on those trails of life and you've made left turns and right turns and one mistake after another. You don't know where you're at. You talk to five people and you get five different answers. You don't know which way to go. Stop right where you are and ask Jesus to come into your life. The Bible says that he rescued us from darkness and put us into the light. If you want to know the right way to live, the right way is found in the Word of God. Colossians chapter 3 tells you in 15 minutes, how you should live, what you should start doing, and what you should stop doing. If you've never made Jesus Lord, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer of salvation. Nothing magical about the prayer, but if you mean it and you pray it with me, then you can mark this as the day of your salvation. So it's a simple prayer. Here's what it is. Repeat it after me, and you don't have to close your eyes, or you can if you want. Lord Jesus, today I trust you. I accept your forgiveness for all my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word and help me to live for you. Thank you for my salvation. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it and you could honestly say in 20 years when somebody says, when did you become a Christian? You go, well, it was some guy online church back when it was popular. <laughs> and I heard the message and I made Jesus Lord. If you prayed that prayer, let us know. We have a Next Steps tab, and it'll guide you in the process. We have a New Believers, New Testament. Wherever you are in the world, if you'll let us know where you're at, we'll mail you one. You can begin to read it. Remember, Colossians can change your life 15 minutes. How do you pray for each other? Pray that we know God's will, change our lives accordingly, and experience the supernatural of God.